Hello and welcome to today's webinar with Learning Sciences International. Today's webinar is on the focused uh, teacher evaluation model. But before we get started with today's presentation, I'd like to jump into a few housekeeping items. For, for those of you on the uh, webinar, we have you in a listen only mode, meaning we can't hear you, uh, but we do want you to interact with us. If you look at your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see that there is a chat box there. Uh, you can type in your questions into that chat box, and we will hold any questions you ask for the presenters until a Q&A session at the conclusion of the webinar. Also, you can type in any technical issues you're having in the chat box regarding your audio and video, but we encourage you to go out to gotowebinar.com and click on their 24-7 support, and one of their technicians will help you with any technical issues you might be having. You can follow us on Twitter during the webinar, hashtag MFEM. That's a way for you guys to uh, chat about what is going on during the webinar. Also, if you look at the GoTo webinar control panel, you'll see that there's a handout section there. Uh, you can download a copy of the slide presentation being used today, and also an overview on the model is found there as well. We are recording the webinar today, and at the conclusion of the webinar, you'll receive a notification. So you can go back and review any of this information or share it with a colleague. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to our presenters today. Uh, today on the call with us, we have Dr. Beverly Carball and we have Dr. Robert Marzano. Uh, very, very honored to have Dr. Marzano on the webinar uh, to talk about his model with us today. Uh, Bob, could you tell us a little bit about your background uh, before diving into the presentation? Well, sure, but just one correction. Uh, the, 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 uh, yes, it's, it's my model, but it was, was co-developed by uh, Dr. Beverly, Car Beverly Carbaugh, whom you'll be talking to in a second. Um, the, uh, I've been in education, this is my 50th year. I started teaching in 1968. Um, most of my career has been working as an R&D person and a consultant. Uh, relative to this particular topic, we had the uh, uh, Marzano teacher evaluation model come out. Was it five years ago, Bev? It's five, five or six. I'm lost. Something like it's, that. It's now six. My audio is coming and going, but you are correct. We're up to six. Okay. This is our sixth year. My gosh. Uh, and uh, as uh, as the next slide indicates, uh, the um, it really had a foundation in work that goes back decades. Uh, if you want to go way, way back, it was the book uh, Classroom Instruction That Works. That was the year 2000 and many other books uh, in between. Uh, in a, throughout, throughout the, some, the webinar, we'll explain why you know, why, why, why the focused model? Uh, and there was just a need uh, for a more, a leaner approach, uh, given the constraints that most administrators and supervisors have in terms of the number of observations they can make. Plus, we've been collecting data for those six years uh, from, through the Marzano Center, and we just followed the data. So it'll, there'll be some new things, certainly, but there'll be some old things that people uh, uh, recognize. But actually, the star of the show here is Dr. Dr. Beverly Carbaugh. So Beverly, would you, would you talk about yourself a little bit and your extensive background? I will. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marzano. I'm sorry if my audio cuts out again. I am coming to you from hot, uh, sunny, Central Florida down in the Tampa area and I am the vice president and senior fellow at Learning Sciences Marzano Center where we do research on uh, teacher evaluation, teacher effectiveness, leader evaluation, leader effectiveness and uh, I work closely with Bob to uh, look at evaluation. That's really been our business together for quite some time. We like to write together, we like to talk about the business, we like to talk about uh, what we can do to give teachers the most accurate feedback so they will keep growing. And I think as you listen to this webinar today, you're going to see how we have used the last five or six years to actually drive us to what I'm going to say a different level with teacher evaluation. And it's been uh, this model has been developed in response to what we have learned in the field, in addition to Dr. Marzano's, uh, I'm not going to say 50 years of research, but uh, quite a few years of research. So, uh, Bob, why don't we take a deep dive and let's start talking about this model a little bit. Have you introduced yourself while I was uh, out there in cyberspace? Oh yeah, yeah. So I didn't realize it. Kind of. Yes, I have. They know. They know who the both of us are. 
So go okay. ahead. All righty. Well, let me tell you, one of the things as we started talking about updating what I like to call the legacy model that was based on the art and science of teaching, and it's a, a very comprehensive model, we started looking at is there an actual teaching gap that could be resulting in a rigor, rigor gap for our students. So some of our conversation is focused around wow what do we focus on do we focus on the standards do we focus on instruction what about our kids and our students should it be achievement and you know what we really believe that we have an evaluation model that would actually address all of these factors so if you're a district and you're actually asking, you can go ahead, Paul, why would we want to update from that original, more comprehensive model to, as I heard uh, Dr. Marzano just mentioned, this more streamlined, compacted model? Why would we want to do that? Well, we believe that there are some direct benefits to observers and to teachers one of the very first uh, benefits is that it still is very evidence-based. Do you want to talk about that, what we mean when we say it's an evidence-based model, Bob? Uh, yeah, well, even though it's uh, at it, it, one level primarily an observational tool, uh, what you observe is certainly what the teacher does, but actually as important, if not more importantly, you look at the, the you, you monitor students, you look at what is happening with the student. Uh, and that's been the focus from the beginning. The assumption is that the things the teacher does in a classroom should create uh, observable changes in student behaviors and interactions. And so it's very, very concrete evidence. There's another uh, use of evidence too, and that is what does the research say about the use of this model? And we'll get into that in a, in a few slides. Uh, but, uh, but, but, de you know, de de definitely, on the observational side as well, what 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 changes do you see in the student that indicate this this strategy is actually having the desired effect? As a longtime practitioner, I like the fact that our evaluation model is not subjective. It's very objective because we really do look at the evidence. Some of the other benefits that you see there on the screen is that there is no scripting. That actually, when we introduce you to what are the protocols. If you're currently using the model, you're very familiar, even though the protocols have been updated, but it eliminates to script. We actually give you a list or a menu of teacher evidences and a list of student evidences that make it very evidence-based. We have tied the observations or uh, related it very closely with the standards. And as Dr. Marzano mentioned, student evidence has become very prominent. It always was, but as we've done this update, we have really ensured that we focus on, are we seeing students learning as a result of our teaching? And at the end of the day, there's a real focus in this compacted model on being able to give accurate feedback using evidence so that teachers really see the value in the feedback that they're getting. So why the Marzano teacher evaluation model? Let's talk a little bit about the research behind the model. So Bob, I'm going to ask you if you will kind of walk us through these next few slides sure. and talk yeah. about research. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to. Um, and actually, I'm going to lead uh, with uh, the. Bev talked a bit about uh, you know script, script, scripting, or some people call it script taping. And there's no, the, you don't have to do that within this model. And just to give you an historical historical perspective on that, uh, one thing good about you know being in the field for 50 years is you actually over the time get to see you know different movements. Um, and actually, the notion of script tape taping was uh, was introduced decades ago under the assumption that uh, a part of teacher development uh, should be uh, teachers explaining why they did certain things. And, uh, and there's validity to that where you say, well, you know, gee, here's what I was doing. You know, somebody points out, here's what you were doing. And the teacher explains why they were doing that. So is meant is more of a super advisory tool, the act of script, script tape, taping, uh, and, and, you know, came into kind of a constructivist approach to learning where teachers would analyze what they did by reading the script, 
script or script tape the script tape and then say and then that would help them form conclusions about what worked and what didn't work it kind of got applied to teacher evaluation although that wasn't its uh, initial purpose um, so when Bev says you know we use evidence based well we in this model you look at okay there there's, there's a certain strategy being used you know what specifically should we see in students which gives it I would assert uh, more of an objectivity uh, 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 and, and also it cuts down in, uh, the labor intensiveness of an observation. Um, since this came out, oh, so over six years now, we've collected a lot of data at the Marzano Center, uh, Learning Science at the Marzano Center. Uh, I think, I believe it's one of the, you know, we, we conducted over time, so basically it's the, one of the largest validation studies. Uh, you see some of the data there, observation data sets alone indicate that. Uh, here, here's some, um, uh, averages are here. Some trends we found that the uh, the, the uh, we uh, the elements scored range from 1.48 million to 1.85 million across three years. So that's not 1.48 million uh, observations, but actually elements that are scored data points, if you will, uh, included 248,000 and 277,000 evaluation observations across three years. So notice this is across years. This is not one year. This is three years. Um, largest data set available, I believe, analyzing correlations between student growth on state assessments and raw observation scores. Um, so it might be there is another data set this big, but if there is, we're not aware of it. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, we've done a number of different types of studies. Uh, we did a validation study looking actually at um, uh, you know, the model used in different ways, and that included 58,000 to 63,000 teachers across three years. Uh, we looked at uh, the use of the model, its effect, excuse me, the relationship between scores in the model and student growth on state assessments. Um, and, uh, you know, those are, when you create that type of correlation, it's usually called a validity coefficient. Um, the uh, 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 in general, we, we had included 12,000 to 13,000 teachers dependent upon the year. So bottom line, there was just a lot of data that's been collected. And as Bev said, that's what we looked at, you know, to come up with the, uh, the focused teacher evaluation model. Uh, let's look at the next slide there. Um, this was a relatively specific study that we did. Uh, I, I, I actually, if you hit the, uh, Paul, you, there's two more. Yeah, there you go. Why don't you get them all? There's one more, I believe. Good. Um, uh, I, 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 again, I, I'm not sure if there's any other model who's quite done this. If there is, I'm not sure. I, I haven't heard of it. Um, we looked at the model from a uh, perspective of those people who received coaching versus those people who didn't receive coaching. Um, uh, first of all, we found that in general, even across those groups, the teachers with higher observation scores had higher student growth on state tests. Um, uh, we found that all elements in the model have a po positive correlation to student learning gains. And that's kind of a big one because now this was the legacy model, as Beth called it. We had 41 elements in that model. And all of those elements had positive correlations with student learning gains as measured by state tests. And again, I believe that's the only model to have gotten down to that level of specificity at the element level. Um, uh, many times it's common just to look at, gee, does the overall score on a teacher evaluation model correlate with uh, student knowledge gain? Or, you know, are, do, are, 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 are five categories in a teacher evaluation model that the score on those five larger categories that they correlate. I think we're the one of the few, or I believe the only one to get down to the level of 43 different um, uh, uh, correlations, uh, looking down at the specific element. Uh, principal, obs uh, uh, pr principal observes that receiving training and side-by-side -side coaching uh, correlation coefficients increased. Uh, stated differently, when uh, observers, in this case principals, uh, receive training and teachers receive training, actually the validity coefficients uh, um, uh, increase. Um, when examining teacher attributes, including advanced degrees, teacher observation scores was the largest predictor uh, in the study of student growth on state assessments. Uh, stated in non-technical terms, that means when you line up things like how experienced teachers were and you know other factors and you know, how did that correlate with uh, you know student growth the strongest correlation was their observational score 
So you put that all together and it says, you know, this has been really, really well vetted. But again, uh, we took that data and said, okay, now, you know, what do we do with it to take the next step in terms of making teacher evaluation as effective as possible? Now, Bev, you're going to help me out with this next part, won't you? I, uh, because... I will, because I love this slide. I just think it is one of the most telling slides for us as practitioners and educators that we've been going into classrooms for the last five to six years collecting data, and this is actually reflective of not the current year, but the last school year it was updated. And what we have found is that we actually do a great job as teachers teaching what I'd like to call those foundational instructional uh, strategies and skills. We do a great job with identifying critical content, practicing, and uh, chunking into digestible bites and reviewing. We spend about half of our time doing these core instructional strategies, and there's nothing wrong with that because they form a strong basis. But this is where we really want to see a shift. Let's look at what we see less of, so to speak. There are instructional strategies that I like to say that are more complex and probably require more uh, planning on the part of the teacher and you really have to spend time uh, you know, setting up the lesson to go deeper and to uh, teach kids how to think. So when we start looking at some of the uh, instructional strategies, the elements from the original model, and we look at things like examining errors in reasoning, engaging students in complex tasks, and revising knowledge. Bob, look at that total. Yeah, we, that's, uh, I'm sorry, Beth. No, go ahead, because well, I, go, go, <laughs> go ahead, Beth. I'm hoping what you're going to talk about is that we haven't seen a lot of change here. No, I know that precisely. And as Bev said that, the top part of the graph, those are all really necessary. Those are foundational instructional strategies. So it's good that teachers spend a lot of time on that. But uh, under the assumption that the new standards at the state level and even national level, um, things like the next generation science standards really are asking for more rigor on, in terms of student thinking, those top level strategies don't get you there. You know, they're foundational. You absolutely have to do things like identify critical, critical information, review content and chunk, et cetera, et cetera. But to get to the level of rigor that I think is being called for, it's those bottom set of strategies that are necessary. And that's the scary part. You know, we still don't see much of this. So, you know, 1.9% of the time in our, all those observations we talked about, you know, we saw teachers engaging students in examination of errors in reasoning or cognitively complex task or revising knowledge. I mean, for me, revising knowledge, boy, is one of the most is one, one of those powerful strategies that teachers can use. We'd actually have students go back and look at what they were right about and wrong about relative to content, and what's new and, you know, and, and, and to, uh, uh, and, and, and to make changes and, uh, and, and call out, you know, things that are still confusing. Uh, and so obviously we need some, something to get more of an emphasis on the types of strategies seen in the bottom graph. And that's one of the reasons for uh, a, a revised model. And you know something, Bob, that's exciting for uh, practitioners out in the field. We always talk about that we're, re, uh, we're data-driven and we make data-driven decisions. This update to this model really is driven by certainly the legacy research, but it really brings in the more contemporary, the live research, and it was really very much a part of the decision-making process and the compacting of this model. For me as an educator, I think that's exciting. I'm not sure that all models that are out there uh, in the marketplace actually can have this kind of data and make the decisions uh, based on live data. I think that's pretty exciting. Why don't you give me the overview, Bev? I will. You know what? Let's talk about this model a little bit because tell you what, no one gets very excited when they hear the word evaluation. It doesn't matter if you're a leader or a teacher. So we really want to think about what in the world is the goal of evaluation? Why do we do it? And I like this slide because it says, you know what? It's like walking a tightrope. Is evaluation all about growth? Is it all about measurement? And Bob often does this little exercise and basically at the end of it, 
what it comes out. You know, it has to be a balance. It can't be all about just measuring you at a point in time. If we're just doing that and we're not giving you an opportunity to grow, then we're probably not going to be a very effective with our evaluation. So as this update was uh, in the process, these factors were very much into play. So let's, let's move forward and talk more about this evaluation model. So what was the design? Well, the design was very much focused on aligning instruction with all of those rigorous standards that every teacher is confronting. Doesn't matter if you're using Common Core or state standards, we all are using standards in our classroom. But the, this model really does look at student evidence and students' results. And we talked about this earlier about being very objective. And there really is, a, even though it is a compacted instructional model, there is, if you look at those instructional strategies, it really scaffolds from those foundational to the more complex. And the model is still focused on growing a teacher's practice. So if we, we continue to look about the goals, what are the goals uh, for the use and the implementation of this model? And th this is exciting for those of us that are out in schools. Teachers, if we're going to evaluate teachers, they want specificity. Give me very specific feedback. What do I need to do to get better? Accuracy, if we want to be valid and, and be respected, we need to have accuracy within uh, our observations, iterator agreement. So another benefit of this model is with the, the compacting, it, it really should reduce the time and the, uh, the burden on principals and teachers because it's, we're looking at very specific elements. The protocols will allow to give very uh, strong diagnostic feedback to help in that growth process. And again, the model is very much aligned with uh, all of those different folks that are out there talking about achieving the core and aligning instruction with standards. So now let's really get into the model, Bob, after we get all through all this rationale here. I'm going to give you the big overview of the model because as we developed it, and as you look at this, some of you are going to say, oh, I see standards-based planning. And in the uh, original, the legacy model, planning was in domain two. In this model, planning comes right up front. It still is an important domain that we believe that for successful teaching, effective teaching, uh, it starts at the planning phase. And then we move into the domain of standards-based instruction. But for instruction to work, you have to create an environment in your classroom and conditions for learning, which we'll get into in a minute. But kind of superseding around all of this are those professional responsibilities that we have to do to maintain our professional uh, standards as teachers. So that's the big overview. And now we're going to get really down into the model. So Paul, let's look at an actual map. So if you look, we're going to start with standards-based planning. If you are familiar with uh, the original model, we actually had a total of 60 elements. This model is reduced to 23 elements. In the standards-based planning domain, you'll find just three elements. Let's take a look at what, once we plan, where do we go in the model? Sometimes you ask yourself, which comes first, the chicken or the eggs? Which comes first, the conditions or the instruction? So uh, if we look at instruction, as Dr. Marzano mentioned earlier, we did have 41 elements within uh, the traditional domain two. We've kind of pulled those apart just a little bit so we can give you more of that diagnostic feedback, uh, very uh, razor-like, uh, elements and we've kind of separated out into two different domains. One is the instruction and then the conditions that support that instruction. So we went from 41 to 17 elements. There's 10 core elements in the standards-based instruction and there are seven elements over in the uh, conditions for learning. Some of you are probably saying, well, what happened to those other elements? Are they not important? They absolutely are. Teaching is complex. 
teachers make a lot of moves during the course of a day. They need a lot of different strategies, techniques, elements. But for the purposes of evaluation, we don't need to evaluate every move a teacher makes. So within the evidence base, you will still find most of those elements embedded. But as far as evaluation, they've been compacted. And then kind of the foundation for all of this would be your professional responsibilities. So you want to add anything to that, Bob? Uh, just, to, just to reiterate that one point you made that uh, things that were in the old model that have been compacted here, that doesn't mean that those things that uh, got classified under one small piece here aren't you, you that, that you can't focus on those probably the most obvious is on the conditions for learning if you go to the one two three the fifth bullet down using engagement strategies um, well in the old model there were eight different types of engagement strategies they're still very important uh, and so uh, but for evaluation and observation purposes uh, it's very straightforward to, to identify to what extent are students engaged, to what extent is the teacher using engagement strategies. And if the teacher is lacking in that area, that's when you go back and you say, well, gee, what are the possible things the teacher could be doing? And as Bev said, she'll show you shortly that in the protocols, those eight different things, you know, that uh, used to were separate uh, se separate elements in the legacy model, they're still there. You know, so. For the purposes of development, teacher development and growth, that's where you that's where you take what has been shrunk and and go back to the granular level again. And that's the difference between the development piece, helping teachers grow, and the measurement piece versus the measurement piece, which is as effectively and efficiently as possible uh, give teachers feedback about what they are or are or are not doing in the classroom. Absolutely. So Paul, let's take a look. We've mentioned protocols and uh, before we get to one of them, let's talk about uh, what the process would look like because as part of the design of this model was to make it very process oriented so that the protocols are gonna be very process oriented and the process is uh, simplified. It all begins, we believe, in a planning conference where the observer and the teacher sit down and talk about what the lesson is going to look like. This is what I call setting you up for success. As an observer, I'd sure like to know what the lesson is going to look like when I walk in a classroom. And for a teacher, this is that opportunity to get ready to showcase uh, the lesson that I'm going to be uh, demonstrating when you come in. Then there's the actual observation. In a few minutes, we'll look at this process called a five-step process for observation to really uh, help us with iterator agreement. And then the post-conference is very evidence-based because sometimes, uh, Bob, I think people misunderstood our original model and they really felt when they walked out the door that the observation was over. And sometimes we didn't have an opportunity to really see the student work that actually took place after the observer left. And we couldn't always give teachers the, I'm just going to say the credit for the good job they were doing because we, uh, in many cases, closed the, op uh, the observation door when we walked out. And as part of this uh, evidence-based process, we would really encourage at the post-conference to continue to look at that observation to see that we're able to get the desired effect with majority or uh, almost all of the students. So that's a little bit different, isn't it? Yes, uh, yeah, no, you're right. I think there was a misunderstanding that uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, once the observation was over, you were then collecting uh, uh, information. Uh, and I think that was all part of the times. Remember, the this last wave of teacher evaluation started with race to the top legislation. And the assumption under race to the top legislation uh, was that teacher evaluation was going to receive a lot more time and energy than it had in the past. And that was unfortunately kind of a flaw in the logic uh, because there just isn't more time to, uh, to, to be had, you know, to have teachers observe more. And I mean, that really, the assumption was that teachers would be observed five, six, seven times. And of course, that just didn't happen. So given that constraint, the teachers are still only going to be observed a handful of times. You can't just, lend, you can't just limit the evidence you get 
about what was happening in the classroom to what you observe. That has to be, there's more evidence that gets uh, disclosed in, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the post conference. And so that is arguably, you know, equally as important as the uh, observation part, the interaction with the teacher afterward. Absolutely, especially as we focus on those student evidences. Let's take a real quick look at a standards-based planning protocol. So, Paul, if you want to go ahead and go to that next slide. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Marzano teacher evaluation, for every element, for all 23 of those elements that you saw back on that uh, learning or teaching map, there is a matching protocol that actually walks you step by step through what is involved in that element. It has a focus statement that actually describes teacher behaviors. It has uh, the desired effect. What result do you want by using this element? It gives you, uh, in this case, planning evidences and implementation evidences. When we get to the observation, it actually looks a little bit different. But I love the protocols. I call them menus for success because if you're a brand new teacher or a very veteran teacher, if you use these protocols, they can really guide your practice. They really help you to have uh, opportunities to expand your toolkit and to grow. So what you're looking at on the screen is an example of a protocol from a standards-based, from the first element about standards-based planning. And what you're going to see there in that focus statement is that, you know, we're planning units, rigorous units, with learning targets embedded within a performance scale that demonstrates a progression of learning. So what used to be back in domain two has kind of been pulled up to domain, to this planning domain, and what used to be old design question one, you're going to see all of that kind of intertwined here, compacted into this domain. So let's uh, take a look at the scale because this is one of the most exciting things. I'm going to have Bob talk about the scale, even uh, at the scale level, the zero through four. We'll get to the language of the difference between standard space planning units and instruction, but the scale stays the same. Bob, why don't you talk to us about a generic kind of approach to the scale? Sure. And remember, it's important to remember this is dealing with planning. Okay. Mm -hmm. When we get to the instruction piece and also the setting the context for learning, the logic of the scale changes, although the you know number of elements, excuse me, the uh, number of values uh, stay the same. Uh, so let's look at not using. Uh, the teacher makes no attempt to plan. You know, that's pretty straightforward, but we're looking at teacher evidence now, what the teacher does. Uh, the beginning, uh, and some people don't like to use a zero, one, two, three, four, and the actually, uh, descriptors, the, the names are, are, are more descriptive of what you expect. Uh, you know, the teacher is attempting to plan in an appropriate way, but is, you know, making some mistakes and has, has a few missing pieces. At the, develop, at the developing level, uh, the teacher is, uh, uh, you know, has, is not making any overt errors, you know, but not everything there is there. It's at the applying level that you're shooting for. I mean, that's, that's kind of the minimally accepted level uh, if you're looking at uh, effective performance in actually any, any one of the areas. At the in innovating level, the teacher is going above and beyond. And in this case, the teacher going above and beyond means going above and beyond his or her own classroom. Uh, so the teacher is actually, uh, uh, wait a minute, I got this right. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, sure. Yeah, no, hel yeah, helps others. Sorry, I'm getting a little senile here. Yeah. Now that the logic of that's going to change when we get to observing instruction. Uh, the although same scale, same some same number of values, but the, the logic logic change slightly, changes slightly. And for those of you familiar with the original model, at the innovating, especially in some of the domain two, three, and four elements, sometimes we would talk about was seen as an expert. Well, we've just fine-tuned that. How are you seen as an expert? You actually help others. You share your expertise with them. So it's just a little more definitive. Again, based on feedback from you folks out in the field, based on the research, to make it a very uh, what I'm going to say, teacher and observer friendly scale. So, Paul, why don't we take a look 
at our next domain, which is going to be instruction. And before we actually get into an element of uh, from the instructional domain, I want to walk you through what we believe is a step-by-step -step guide for an observer when they actually walk in a classroom. And you can go ahead and put them all out there for us, Paul. But you know, the very first thing that is observer always ask uh, himself, herself, when they walk in, what am I actually seeing when I walk in here? And is that teacher using the strategy correctly, which is really down on the scale, as you'll see in a minute, at a level two. And then what we do is take from level two, uh, you could, Bob would probably say, oh, Beth, that's actually a level three. But uh, what I'm going to say is, uh, if you go to the next step, what strategy does the teacher use to monitor? That's when we really start seeing us, you're doing it correctly, you're starting to monitor. That's gonna be, uh, if we equate it with the scale, like at the level three, and then we start talking about, so we're monitoring, we're uh, seeing student results, what percentage of students are demonstrating learning. And remember, this would only be for those 10 instructional elements that you would use this observational process. Then, and this is kind of critical, this is that formative assessment that goes on in the classroom. I'm monitoring whether my students are actually being able to demonstrate the desired effect. And then do I need to make an adaptation? Do I need to change something up so that even more of my students can show the desired outcome or the desired effect? This is a uh, embedded within the really within the protocol and if you use eye observation our virtual platform it actually walks you through this as you're doing an observation it's it's really a, a cool support piece so paul let's take an actual look at a protocol in the instructional domain and we'll start with identifying critical content from the standards and look it looks very familiar to what you just saw in planning. Focus statement, a desired effect, but here's where we start to see that shift. We're now looking at teacher use of instructional techniques, and then there's a new little section if you're, a, if you're currently using the model and you're familiar with teacher uh, instructional techniques, but this next is part of that five-step process. What am I doing as a teacher to monitor for learning. What technique do I use? Am I using a group activity, student work, uh, some kind of a response methods, questioning sequences? What am I doing to monitor in my classroom? And then what are what is the actual student evidence or the activities, the responses that happens uh, happen within the classroom? And then do I need to make an adaptation? And I'm moving quickly because I wanna get to the scale so let's move on to this next scale and then I'm going to go back to letting Bob talk about this scale because there is a change if you're a current customer. So Bob, walk us back through this and point out this big critical change. Uh, so the, um, again, still, we still have not using up through uh, innovating, not using uh, the, again, the teachers not using the strategy. Remember, we're contrasting this with the planning uh, scale, which that we were looking only at the teacher there. Now we're looking at the teacher in the context of using instructional strategies. Uh, beginning uh, uh, teachers uh, using the strategy, but um, you know there's missing pieces or maybe a little a few clunky parts. Uh, developing uh, uh, the 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 teacher is uh, using the strategy, um, uh, and there aren't necessarily errors in the strategies, but but it's not having the desired effect on the majority of students. If you look at the last part there, but less than the majority of students are displaying the desired effect. So when you get to developing, by definition now, the observer is looking for what's the effect on students and teacher might be using a strategy correctly without any mistakes, but not many of the students are engaged, less than the majority. At the applying level, now again, the teacher is not making any mistakes, but the majority of students, you know, are uh, experiencing the desired effect at the appropriate taxonomic level. I'll Bev explain that in a second. And then at the innovating level, and this is, I assume, the one you're talking about, Bev. Uh -huh. uh, in, in the um, uh, in the original model, we had said to get the innovating level, the um, uh, uh, the teacher had to be using the strategy uh, without any error and reaching every single student. 
And that just over the years, we found just caused a tremendous amount of <laughs> debate and angst. Uh, and so uh, we changed that. Instead of 100% of the students are receiving the desired effect, we changed that to 90%. And there's still great debate about that. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and I, I said in the early stages when uh, when uh, actually Bev was the one who said, we've got to change that from 100% to 90%. And, and uh, I somewhat facetiously said, I finally gave in because Bev threatened waterboarding, but actually <laughs> <laughs> there was a good logic to it also. <laughs> no, but really, Bob, you and I have had these conversations. The, the intent is still 100%, but we have, and I've heard you talk about this, you know, in our classrooms, we have students sometimes with special needs. We have students that are learning a second language. And we, we always, in the original model, took into consideration that the desired effect would look different from those students than perhaps other students. But it, it seemed to get too complicated. So this is kind of one of those concessions. But yeah. uh, we all still need to shoot for the all. But this is the answer to uh, many, many teachers in the field said, I always have that one student and I can never get that one student. So now you can get that one student. No, I'm, I'm being facetious. But so moving right along, we need to uh, look at what uh, Bob calls the setting the context for learning, the conditions for learning. And if you remember from the old model, we used to have enacted on the spot. Many of those elements and strategies are embedded in the conditions for learning. Look at this protocol. Protocol for the, uh, this domain looks exactly the same as in the instructional uh, domain. And guess what? The scale is going to be the same format of the scale. To me, that's one of the greatest benefits of uh, Marzano teacher evaluation model is having a consistent scale. And some of you are probably looking at this and saying, oh, we don't use not using beginning, developing, applying, innovating in our state. And we always tell you that's absolutely fine because you see there's a numeric value associated and really I observation can convert this to whatever your state scale is, and Bob is very familiar with that and often advises and works with us as we configure for different states. So don't get caught up in the language. We call this Marzano scale and Marzano language, but it easily converts. So if your state uses a three-point scale, a four-point scale, or five-point scale, this will all convert to your state language. Am I correct, Bob? Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about observation. You heard Dr. Marzano mention earlier that, you know, with Race to the Top, we all thought there were going to be, what was it, Bob, eight to 10 uh, data collection yeah. opportunities or observations. Yeah. But, but talk to us about what's happened. Well, th those were the early discussions. They really were. And actually, to kind of defend that, if uh, if uh, if it were possible uh, and for principal uh, supervisors to make ten observations and had the resources to to do that, then th then it would make sense to have observational models with a lot more com with a lot more components. It really would. Mm -hmm. um, the and and if you could you could, if you could observe teachers ten or more more times you'd really get a lot of pretty powerful uh, powerful data that's just not going to happen it's really not and that's why uh, after six years you know uh, and, and seeing the reality of the field you know we we developed the the, the 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 focus model now there's a lot of different ways you can collect data we already mentioned it's not just the observation but it's also the post conference or, or the the conference after the observation that is still collecting uh, uh, venues for, for for collecting data but as the slide here indicates you can have formal observations informal uh, targeted uh, with a specific focus and, and even walkthroughs can, can be used uh, you know as a instead of just you know focusing on the formal observation all of these can be used for, as ways of gathering data uh, to get the most accurate picture of a teacher as possible so Bob, you can talk you about these 
Go ahead, well, sir. I was going to ask you, do you think during the course of a year that we should be able to collect evidence on all 17 of those uh, domain one elements or the instructional yes. and no, I yes, I do. I think I mean that's you know we've had a lot of conversations about this. Let's get it down to a number that you really can, over time, collect information on every one of them. I I think you have to be targeted in some case. The third one down there. So mm -hmm. when you, you know, if you're keeping track and eye observation, which is very easy to do, of the data you have on teachers, you'll start to see holes. You'll start to see areas for which you don't have any data. Well, they become targeted observations now. Now you go in and not look just in general terms. Uh, you go in and look for evidence of those things that you don't have, have data for. And e even walkthroughs, I, I know that you, you indicate this, that the model was not designed you know, as a walkthrough instrument per se, but walkthroughs can also be used though to collect data on teachers. If you are doing walkthroughs as administrators and you happen to be in a class where a teacher, you know, there's not, has been observational evidence for certain things and you happen to see it, why not record it? So yeah. you kind of expand the notion of observation now. And given that we've had a greatly compacted, we have a greatly compacted model, which still has a specificity within the, within the protocols, I think you really can and should collect data on um, the uh, on all the elements on the in the instructional side at least thank you well let's take a look at the very last domain in this compacted model let's look at the professional responsibilities and we're just going to look real briefly at one of the protocols about promoting leadership uh, and collaboration so for some of you that are familiar with um, the original legacy model what you're going to recognize is domains three and four have been compacted into this one professional responsibilities area. What you see is the protocol looks very familiar now, the same focus statement, the desired effect. Now again, the desired effect here is probably going to be the teacher because this is all about the teacher's professional responsibilities. But if we take, uh, do we, and I believe we have a scale on the next slide. Yeah, next, next slide. And so look, we see that same scale, and as Dr. Marzano has kind of walked us through that generic language, again, the not using, you don't make an attempt to do it, or you have some error if, as you're doing it. You're attempting, but you're, you're having problems. Uh, the developing is you're doing everything in that focus statement, and then applying is you're getting some results, and then the innovating look, it's helping my expertise uh, and sharing it with others. And there is a lot of ways. Uh, there's the supervision book, Dr. Marzano, that you wrote that really helps if people need to see the evidence base for a lot of that. That book really gives a, a, a lot of different ways to collect evidence at the innovating level in, in this domain particularly. So I believe that we are... Uh, getting to the end of this model and I want and I'm sure that Dr. Marzano will actually reassure everyone that nothing has gone away. We have made this a model that we believe will help give teachers very accurate feedback so that they continue growing. It's designed to for observers to be able to spend really high quality time in a classroom, be able to get focused uh, down on some very specific instructional strategies. So Bob, would you like to add any uh, closing remarks about the update to the model before we go out and let Paul uh, let us know if we have any questions? Sure. Well, uh, as you see on the slide, we've got, you know, it was developed through the Learning Sciences Marzano Center. When, he set, when we set up the center six years ago, it was uh, for the purpose of uh, hopefully making a contribution to the feared fields of teacher and uh, principal evaluation with a realization that that field is going to change. And so these changes for us uh, were absolutely necessary given the six years worth of data we had in the changing field and the changing assumptions from the original race to the top legislations to the reality you know of the classrooms right now uh, and five years from now you know hopefully there'll be other adaptations as we we as a profession gain more resources uh, you know for observation uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 
uh, at, at the school and classroom level. So that's, that's why the, that's why the center was set up, set up you know, to 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 help the whole field, you know, with this really important endeavor called the teacher and principal evaluation. We're focusing on teacher evaluation here, and I think we're getting better over time. I, I really do. Uh, this model is our attempt to again take the next step and hopefully improve the endeavor. You know, sometimes I talk to people about evaluation shouldn't be static. It's very much like our uh, cell phones. How often do we update our technology and our cell phones? We do it constantly. Uh, what we know about teachers and what we know about learning, the whole process, we need to update it. When I was a teacher, I went years without any changes in the evaluation model. So it's exciting to be in an era where we can really respond at the center to current data and actually build a model that's based on the data and the input that we get from the field. So Paul, we're gonna now defer to you because hopefully you've been collecting questions and we always try to save the last five to 10 minutes so that people can ask Dr. Marzano the hardest questions possible about this Thanks, model. Thanks, Bev. Where you go, yeah. <laughs> All right, Paul. Um, yeah, we've had many questions come in, so I'm gonna dive right into them uh, and get started. Uh, first question we had that came in, um, asked Dr. Marzano, can you recommend some books that my teachers can read to help them improve their teaching uh, higher order cognitive skills with more rigor. Oh, uh, well, there's a series uh, that uh, put out through LSI and at the Marzano Center that uh, uh, actually on the instructional side uh, takes those elements and elaborates on different instructional strategies. The, um, uh, it's called the Essential Series, and so you can go right on LSI's website. There are others. Um, there's uh, the original art and science of teaching. There's the new art and science of teaching. Uh, there's uh, so that that's quite a few uh, right there. You know that uh, give give you a, a general direction down to very very uh, granular direction about specific strategies and uh, how to uh, uh, you know uh, teach them the most effectively, use them the most effectively. And if you look in your chat window, I just uh, posted a link uh, for the bookstore. Uh, so if you'd like to check out that series, just go ahead and click on that link there. Um, another question, well, you know, we had many questions come in. I'll just, uh, you know, very a lot of questions came in about, you know, does this connect with uh, eye observation? Um, uh, when will the new protocols be updated in eye, in eye observation? Um, how do we make that happen? Uh, Bev, do you want to take that one? And, and I'm glad to help as well if, uh, if you need uh, I absolutely. Eye observation is uh, uh, being updated. All of these protocols will be in eye observation. I want to tell you if you're a current user of eye observation, you're going to love the dashboard that's been created where a teacher can actually follow their evaluation in real time. Uh, every observation, as you know, will <laughs> update. And there's a, a, a cover page that will let teachers see what elements that they have received feedback or perhaps a score in. And it, it's really, it's exciting for me. I was uh, part of designing that because again, as a teacher, I would wanna know where I stand. As an observer, I want something, I mean, as an evaluator, I want something at my fingertips to show me what every teacher, what, what I've observed and what I haven't. So yes, all of this is being updated with NI observation, but the best part is the legacy library that's still over on the other side, not on focused eval, but on the, within the library with all of Dr. Marzano talking about the elements, all of that will still be very useful and very current. So it's, uh, it's really a marriage of the two. Yeah, and of course, we will not update your protocol until you contact us, the account manager. Oh, you know, we, so whenever, you're, whenever you are ready, uh, please reach out to us and we can have that discussion. Um, <clears throat> another question that came in is, uh, is there any connection between the LSI tracker and the focused teacher evaluation model? Uh, Bev, if you want to take that one a little bit. Uh, there is, because again, we're looking at uh, standards and this model would expect a teacher to be teaching a standard. But I'll tell you what, I, I want to save that as a sidebar. So if you can uh, 
Paul, find yes. whoever mm -hmm. that is, isolate it. We'll have a specific conversation about that, okay, instead yeah. of on this, on the big part. Absolutely. Um, okay. uh, uh, I'll take another question here about um, uh, how do you see the new focused uh, model uh, being potentially used with student teachers as part of their formal evaluation? You want to do yeah, that? That's you. Go, no, no, you take that one. Yeah. Okay, I'd be happy to. Well, again, uh, as with any evaluation model, uh, this model will be able to, uh, an observer, whether it would need to be someone trained, whether it's the teacher could use it to give a student teacher very specific feedback. It could be uh, a university observer, but again, they would need to be trained in the protocols and within the model but it's very specific. Those protocols, if you look at those student evidences, it can really help uh, a student teacher build their toolkit with instructional strategies. So this would be very beneficial, not just for evaluation for a, uh, an intern or student teacher, but really for the growth of a student teacher. So, and the thing I like the most, it really is a roadmap about what good instruction should look like. Again, at a more compacted view, but it, it does give you a lot of processes. Hmm. Thank you. And I think um, with that, we're, we're pretty much out of time because I just wanted to take a, a moment, um, Bev, if you could uh, talk a little bit about the, the building expertise uh, conference. There still is time to register uh, for late registration is still open, but that's going to be closing shortly. Uh, Bev, could you uh, and Bob, can you talk about the conference a little bit? Well, building expertise is an opportunity to come and learn everything you ever wanted to know about uh, the work of Dr. Marzano, who is our keynoter, our feature every year. And uh, there will be sessions for leaders. There will be session, uh, sessions for teachers. And there will be some other guests that uh, Bob has invited to share the, the conference with him. But again, if you want to soar to new heights and in teaching and leading, you want to bring a team and come to building expertise. Bob, you want to talk anything about what uh, you have in store for everybody at the conference? Well, Bev and I will do it. We'll be doing a session on the new teacher evaluation model. We'll be talking about uh, I with uh, Brian Toth. Uh, and, um, excuse me, Michael <laughs> Michael Toth uh, and. Uh, and Carla Moore will be talking about just uh, instruction. You know what? Uh, what? What does the model imply relative to instruction? A lot of great presenters. Uh, we always have over a thousand people at the conference. Uh, it's in a great place, <laughs> Disney. It's a lot of fun, and it's developed a real culture. It's, it's very nice. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of like old home week. Uh, people the people don't just come once. They 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 continue to come. You know, multiple years. So it it it, it it's fun. It's, I, I always look forward to it. And I really like to think that it's a first class conference. It's not so big that you get lost in the crowd. So it kind of has a little bit of an intimacy to it, but it's very well done. Disney doesn't do anything unless it's first class. So, uh, and it's a great opportunity if you, if, you, uh, if we affectionately uh, like to be Marzano groupies, it is a great place to uh, be able to talk to Dr. Marzano, shake his hand, get his autograph. There'll be book signings. So come join us and there'll be other guests there too. Um, and for those, again, for those of you on the webinar, uh, there are still many, many, many questions coming in. Um, we'll, we will try to get to these questions um, uh, after the webinar with many of you. Uh, if you, uh, as a district or a school, want to move forward um, with implementation, whether you're completely new to this model, uh, or if you are currently using the model and currently using iObservation and are ready to make that transition, please um, please type something in the chat window right now. Uh, there is a post-webinar survey that you can fill out. You can let us know there if you'd like somebody to get in touch with you. And of course, you can always go out to either MarzanoCenter.com or LearningSciences.com, click on the Contact Us um, form there, and we would be glad to get one of our directors of district partnerships in touch with you uh, to talk next steps. Um, so with that, any closing comments um, uh, from, from Bev and Bob before we uh, close out the webinar today? No, thank you. Just come and join us in, uh, at, at Disney.
thanks for listening, Deb. I reiterate that, and it's just an exciting day to uh, move to this next chapter in teacher evaluation. Thank you, Dr. Marzano. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Carbaugh. <laughs> thank you. Have thank a great you. day. Bye-bye. Thank you both for joining us, and, and have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.